into the Olympics and I was ranked number one in the world as an under 18, 200 metres and 400 metres. Had like 25 scholarship offers for like Harvard and lots of Yeah, start recording, mate. <laughs> start recording. Yeah. All right. Isaac Savage from Glad Rap Channel here with former Olympian Mark Cadell. Welcome. Hey, welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Hey, we're just talking about everything um, going on today. Obviously, we're here for the Joseph Parker Presser, but also Junior Farr, your his manager yep. rider at the moment. How's it going with Farr so far? Oh, that's awesome. I mean, he's just been in the States for four weeks playing John T. Wilder, so I think getting experience in a camp that's about to fight Tyson Fury is an amazing experience because you, that, is, that is one of the top fights that can happen in the world. There's not many better fights in any division that can happen and so to be part of that for four weeks is a great learning experience um, Doug and Eugene went over and spent some time there as well um, and I think that it's fantastic that you know you can see that city kickboxing is a world class gym and world class trainers because you know they you know they got to witness where the top of the world is you know and, and they, they sit right alongside it so it's great to get that experience as coaching as well Just in the short two years or two three years that Far's just come back in the scene. Everything seems to be going on track. You know, you've taken him from zero fights to, you know, unbeaten. I mean, things are going well in your eyes. Yeah, I mean, look, as a manager, you've just got to be really disciplined on on your approach. And yeah, you can take hard fights now, but I don't believe in this is a business, and I don't believe in taking a hard fight unless something's on the line. And so, you know, hey, we'll fight everybody. Like when David Higgins rang me up to see if we'd fight Joseph, I'm like, shit, yeah, of course we will. Mm. We'll fight. But here's the deal. Because I'm not going to cash him out, you know, because, you know, Joseph needs an opponent. They only fight once, so it needs to be for the right money, right? So, you know, we could, we could take some really tough fights, but this is a development sport and you get paid right at the end of it. So you've got to be disciplined and have a plan and a strategy and work hard on it. And that's what we do. It's interesting you say that because you read the articles and you look at the press and, you know, you just mentioned Higgins and you think, oh, there's bad blood there. But seeing you guys here today, mates, it's just BAU, right? Business as usual. Oh, look, I mean, Dave and I have been friends forever, eh, you know, but this is a business. I mean, look, I'm sure I know Junior wants to fight Joseph, and I would say that Joseph wants to fight Junior. Junior doesn't call Joseph out. Junior says, I can't wait to fight the likes of Dillian White and Joseph Parker and Anthony Joshua because it's aspirational and he's on a journey to get there and he realises that he needs to fight those guys at the right time that suits him, not that suits them. And, and like I said... We're not gonna. We take the tough fights for the money. That's the that's the business. My job is to make Junior money and to make sure he has something at the end of it, and that he's in the position to win. Great approach and look to get him fast tracked to the way you have is, is absolutely phenomenal. Also to see him spending time with Deontay Wild. I mean, how many other New Zealand boxers can say that they've done that? Apart from the likes of Joseph Parker, I see Deontay Wilder as one of the biggest fighters in the world at this stage. Yeah, I mean, like the thing is, is you can have tough fights and you can do it tough and you can take risk on losing and then set you back a couple of years or you can go into camps with Deontay Wilder and have the harder lessons in sparring than in the fight. And so it's about development, you know. When you become professional in boxing, you're not, it's not like you're available for the All Blacks. No, 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 you're just playing club rugby. And when you're a professional rugby player, you are available for the All Blacks straight away. In boxing, you take time to be worth that. You know, yes, you're a prize fighter, but I mean, a prize fighter for 600 bucks on your first fight, it's not really a prize fighter, right? And so we just have to have a very disciplined, measured approach to be successful. And it looks like, um, you know, the way that, the, you know, Parker's, uh, or sorry, Far's progression is, is almost following the, the footsteps of Parker, because if you look at Parker's group, it's been quite strategic as well. Would you say you're sort of blueprinting off that formula? Um, no, uh, to be honest, uh, look, David, David and Duco, you know, they did their development in New Zealand and we're doing ours in America. And I chose to go into America because they had their strategy here. We can pick this up later. Sure. Yeah. Um, talking about progression, Joe Parker. Oh, different angle. You, you were saying following the same blueprint. Yes, oh, yes. Like, no, yep. the okay, so yeah, well, yeah, back yeah. to that. So, talking about the Joseph Parker blueprint, yeah. I would a lot of people would say, you know, that's that's a recipe for success. And I said, have you followed on that yeah. on those footsteps? But you said something a little bit different. No, so I mean, look, I got a, um, I managed a guy who got to number one in the WBO. So I'd kind of been through this process before, and I'd had another guy at number six. So this is my third fighter that I've got into the top ten um, as a manager. And so I, I guess I probably, f I did, I. In some respects, I created that. Uh, well, not created that because it wasn't mine to create, but I achieved that ranking for a fighter, you know, um, ten years ago. 
all right? And so I knew the way to do that, but I decided to do it in America rather than in New Zealand. And I guess what I kind of know is, is that it's promoters that, that own belts. It's not, it's not fighters and managers. And it's TV stations and who you're with. And so uh, I made a strategic decision to go with an American promoter who's well-connected with TV. And of course, Lou DeBella ran HBO, or set up HBO After Dark, which is now just finished. So Lou's very experienced. Lou runs shows for Al Heyman, Bob Arum, and Eddie Hearn over there. So he actually deals with all three of the big, the big three, right? So I made a decision to go there. Uh, Duco made a decision to do everything here in New Zealand. They did a fantastic job. And... Um, <clears throat> Things went their way with Fury losing all his belts, and they jumped on that opportunity because they're in the right place at the right time. And we had the Ruiz fight. Happy days, right? So I, I don't, I can't plan to be in there. So I can't plan for the guys to give up the belts. You know what I mean? And then hope there's some eliminators that we get. You know, we needed to do it a different way, and that was just the way it was in boxing. And Tyson Fury did the the world a massive favour by beating Klitschko, and then he did a massive favour to the world by letting all the belts go. And then now we get all these fun, exciting heavyweight fights. And so, you make a good point, and and you're exactly right. He threw a span into the works, and that's sometimes things you can't plan for. What I was going to say is that for if you're you know sporting background, business now, so acumen, do you bring a bit of ba- bit of that to how you manage fighters? Um, in the promoting world yeah absolutely I mean like I mean I'm involved in in high performance sport and other sports so you know I believe in creating teams and having experts in teams and I don't believe you should do anything you're not good at um, we have a you know s and guy that's one of the top rotational force production experts in the world and Junior Farr is trained by a world class well one probably one of the top two or three rotational force production experts now the boxing industry doesn't even know that that guy exists and I do, and I use him. I use Lydia Coe's, you know, mental performance coach for Junior um, when he brought her from seven to kind of 17 and when she was number one in the world. And so he spent 10 years with Lydia Coe. So his mental performance coach is world class, you know, runs on board. Uh, you know, we've got a treatment specialist as well that Junior sees three days a week. Um, you know, we have Doug Viney and Eugene Barman doing uh, the coaching at City Kickboxing. So we have experts in every area, right? And so it's not just about having a coach that does the training, the physio, you know, everything. You know, I stick to the business of boxing and I'm there to specialise in that side of it and I research the international game, who to go with and who not to go with um, and do a lot of work on who we're fighting and who we're not fighting and then the, the other guys do the rest of the part of the team. So we have a very big, we have a very specialised team and so that's a high performance team and you don't see many fighters with the team. Yeah, look, and well said. I mean, we just heard uh, Far speak out too about health issues. You know, a couple of months back, it was very public that he had a low uh, blood count or iron, iron levels. Since then, what what are the improvements and what what's switched up from what you've just um, responded yes. on? So again, you know, as soon as that fight finished, I knew something was wrong. Uh, if you look at the first round of the fight, he threw 50 punches, did everything we asked him to, then he fell off a cliff, threw 30 punches, and so he just didn't have the have the oomph. And so the next day I tested him. He I tested him at the Millennium Institute. He tapped out in his power, so he did a PB in his power. So I think he did a 74 centimetre vertical jump. I think he threw a one-handed um, shot put, you know, like 16 metres. Um, you know, and so everything was great. So I I knew his power was there. I did his bloods the next day, then I did his VO2 max, which is looking at how much, how many mils of oxygen, or millimoles of oxygen are per litre of blood, and it was quite low. And um, so obviously there was an an issue. Uh, He trained hard, the bloods came back the same day, and he's at 60% of his oxygen. So all nice and fun finding out what the problem is, then you've got to find out what's causing it. So we had to test for cancer, ulcers, you know, internal bleeding. And so he had some internal bleeding. He'd been bleeding um, for a few months, you know, um, out the wrong end, you know. And so he was literally dumping out his iron. And you need iron, ferritin and B12 to create oxygen and blood cells in your liver. And he didn't have the ingredients. So he was trying to bake a cake without the eggs. It just doesn't work. So I then had to find out and figure out what the problem was. Okay. And so how do I, how do I actually stop this? So he had a small procedure. And then it came back again, just before he went away to Wilder, and then we had to change his diet again. And so it was a long process. It took me three or four months to fix it. But it sounds like a continual process ongoing, but as long as you're trying to, um, you know, use things to fix or improve. Yeah, sure. I think that's what Junior's saying is, is that he wasn't giving us the information about how he was feeling and what was happening to him 
physically, you know. And so when, once we found that out, we could start to get it. So he now knows that. I think um, everyone can take away from that too. You know, a lot of, especially in this tough man sport, people probably don't talk about things. And far illustrated that today, that's probably a good thing to talk about to you and other coaches and other boxers out there as well, right? Oh yeah, man. I mean, you, when you're ble- when you're bleeding, you know, as, you know, and you don't want to say something. It's kind of like what they're going at mental health at the moment, eh? You just got to you got to share it, right? It's the same. An athlete has to share with his team. At the end of the day, I'm the conductor. I got to make sure that the violin is going well, and the drums are going well, and the and the, you know the, the brass is going well, and everyone's playing. and And Junior's the star of the show, and we need to make sure that we're all doing our bit. But we ta- can't do our bit without information. And it's been a pretty hectic year for you. Obviously, going to close off in December. There's something lined up for early next year as well, and anything after that? Um, yeah, I mean, we're just negotiating some fights at the moment, but it's the old story. Junior Junior doesn't really know about those. He just focuses on the 16th. I'm always two or three steps ahead as far as negotiating is concerned and making sure we're in the right place, but it's not something he needs to know about until after the fact. All right, we normally have a we normally have a meeting on that. Um, oh, excuse my phone. And I did throw Lucas uh, Big Daddy Brown out there. He was obviously here this weekend, fought Junior Pity Putball, um, or Putball p- Party for the title. Now, would you be open to that fight in the future? Well, of course. I mean, it's the old story. It's like we fight Lucas Brown if he's something that that gives us. Sometimes it's money, sometimes it's rankings, sometimes it's a belt. You know, the only belts that we're after right now is a world title belt. So he doesn't have one of those right now. So, and we're ranked ahead of him. So that means the only other thing we can fight for is cash, right? That's just the business. There's one of three things we fight for. We like to fight for all three. We like to fight for belts, rankings, and cash. So if there's no belts, and I mean world title belts or eliminators, and we're ranked ahead of them currently in the world rankings from a WBO point of view, then it needs to be money. money. And so I just think that if a fighter wants to call a fighter out, I, I love it, but also turn up with the promotion and how much you're paying us and make us an offer. Don't just say, I wanna, I wanna fight this guy, I wanna fight that guy. Come, come, with the, come with the deal, do you know what I mean? Like, we're not calling out Joseph Parker, we gotta, we gotta ask to fight him. I, re- I replied to that invitation. Uh, I, didn't, I, don't go, I don't go, we're gonna fight Joseph Parker tomorrow, David Higgins, pay us this, put the show on, nah. You know, but if I was to call out Joseph, I need to be able to be able to put my money where my mouth is and put the show on. Like you said, if it makes dollars, it makes sense. But there's so many more components to it. You know, it's got to it's got to affect the ranking. It's got to make um, dollars, and it's got to make sense for the future of the fighter. Yeah, yeah. Like I say, I mean, this this game, you make money in your last two or three fights of your life. So we've got to make sure we get them there to to make those that, those dollars right. It's a heavyweight division. It's a fun, it's a very lucrative division, and you gotta you gotta you know. Manoeuvre your way through it, right? It's an exciting journey. We look forward to following you, your career with uh, Fa. Anything else you want to say to everyone watching back home? Oh, no. Just, hey. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thanks for your time today.